I'm going to read John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave the right, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Amen. Did y'all get that picture I sent y'all? Did you get that picture? Hold your hand up if you did, wave it. Wave it. Could you put that picture up on the screen? Last, on Father's Day, I preached about my dad and I told y'all about the white valiant I want y'all to see this picture right here. That's that white valiant that I talked about. That's my sexy, fine mama. I see what Monroe liked about her now. Y'all do know my name is Monroe as well, right? So, uh, love yourself some fine women. Or woman. I'm almost just like my dad. But that's my brother Donald with the glasses. There's my brother Michael. Both of them in the last year have gone on, have passed, which that's me with the hat on, which makes me the oldest brother now. On the ground there is my little, my brother, my little brother, Toby. And uh, Kenneth wasn't born yet. Kenneth hadn't come along yet. I think my daddy came and visited one time about eight years later. Whoop, there it is. And so uh, that's how that works. But remember I tried to explain to you the white value? I put the white value on the screen. Anybody remember that on Father's Day? And remember what, what did I say to y'all? I said, I do not have a family portrait. I do not have a picture with me and my brothers and my dad and my mom. And one of my cousins walked up, I believe it was Barbara, I don't know who it was, walked up to me. Who was it? Deborah walked up to me. Where you at, Deb? She walked, there she is. She walked up to me and she said, I have something. I went through my mom's uh, albums and uh, on Snooky and um, I found this. She brought me, I had two other pictures, but this picture right here changed my life. It literally, Deborah, changed my life. I'm going to blow it up, frame it. I'm going to have it. I'm even going to Photoshop Kenneth on there. Some kind of way. But I'm going to put him on there grown. <laughs> you can find no baby, but he's going to be a big old grown man on there. Say he's the youngest. But it did. It it. it it answered a prayer for me. It, it, um, it gave me something that I always wanted. And um, everybody doesn't know my story of my mom and my dad and everything, but uh, a few years ago, I just took it upon myself to just honor him, even though he was really left when I was really young and you know, so on and so on, he kind of left us. But I realized, man, I, I, I'm here because of him. And I realized that when I looked at the video yesterday of the at, his, at the old house and in Reddick and the, the preaching at the family reunion and all of my cousins and aunties and uncles and stuff, man, I just realized I'm just a McLaughlin to the bone, you know? And I'm gonna tell y'all right now, this is a McLaughlin thing, yeah? Come on, family member, that's our theme for our family reunion. It's a McLaughlin thing. From the subject, 
come to the light. Come to the light. There's a storm out o'er the ocean. It's a hurricane. And it's moving this old way. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. There's a storm out. It's over the ocean and it's moving this way. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, it will surely. Drift away. So, Father, I do thank you now for this opportunity to share your word with this group of people, the hundreds or the thousands that watch online. I pray, God, that if they hear this truth today, that they'll respond. Help us. Help us to know that you have extended us an invitation to come to the light. Help us to realize that that light is Jesus. Thank you, Lord, and amen. Do me a favor, put your hands together for the word of the Lord. It has been said that if you want to get somebody to have a right relationship with God, then what you ought to do is to get them to read the Gospel of John. I remember at 26 years old when I finally got my hands on the Bible. I had never read a Bible before in my life. And when I finally got my hands on the Bible, I got to the book of John and it answered so many questions for me. I never been taught by anybody, wasn't duped by nobody, wasn't shaped by a denomination. I had had an encounter with the Lord in my home and then God gave me his word. And I remember reading the Gospel of John. It has been said that if somebody is just a church member, just a member of a church only, with no real relationship with God, if somebody is just on a church roll and trying to serve God, but doesn't really know who Jesus is, and somebody said, just read to them and explain to them the book of John. And even if somebody is on fire for the Lord, right, is a member of a church and knows who Jesus is, then it's been said, let them continue to read the book of John. Let them read it regularly. It can help your faith. So this book of John, or the gospel of John as it's called, contains the greatest story ever told. It contains the single most powerful gospel narrative in two verses together in the entire Bible. These two verses changed my life. I want to know if it changed yours. John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Amen. Jesus didn't come to condemn anybody. Everybody was jacked up. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus came into the world to, journey, to judge the world of sin. His presence here did just that. So that John 3, 16 and verse 17, 16 in particular, is called the gospel or the good news in a nutshell. You see them signs everywhere. We were at Royal Rumble this year down in St. Petersburg. That's right, Royal Rumble. And going to be at WrestleMania next year, so don't look at me like that. And you see these John 316 signs everywhere. You see them at football stadiums. You see them in baseball stadiums. You see it at huge venues. You see it at concerts. You see them in, in some of the places where those people who've been impacted by that verse just seem that if we can just get that message out, that gospel in a nutshell, if they can get people to find out what does John 6, 316 say, 
that it can touch their hearts and that eventually they can receive what it is that Jesus came to bring. It's the linchpin that holds the entire theme of the Bible together. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And John 3.16 is what connects the two. All the law and the prophets were speaking concerning Jesus, right? And then Jesus explains to us and fulfills everything that the law and the prophets had come to say. Are y'all all right out there? So let me make something clear up front. If anyone wants to avoid, wants to avoid eternal separation from God. Now, it's what the Bible calls hell, right? All you have to do is believe in Jesus. Amen. Belief entails a little more than that. There's repentance and faith, you know what I mean? But you have to believe that he is, right? So them that come to God must first believe that he is. And he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. Uh, I was given this word from the Lord. I've never heard this before. I've never said it before, but I put it on the screen and it simply says this, no Jesus, no heaven. No Jesus, no hell. Did you get that? I know Bobby can help me preach that one right there. No Jesus, no heaven. But if you know Jesus, no hell. So it's, it's, it's very simple, very simple. So listen to what the Bible says that Jesus can do for us. John 1, 12 is on the screen. It said, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So he says, as many as receive him. Now, he didn't say try him. Yeah, you try wonton oxtails. You try reading War and Peace. You, 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 if you're a Cowboy fan, you try making the playoffs. <laughs> but in order to be right with God, <laughs> all my Cowboy fans, they're hating on me. Why y'all hate everybody? Uh, you receive Jesus. You have to believe and just receive him. As many as receive him, to them he gave you power to become the sons of God. In the Gospel of John, we discover some much needed truths. We discover that Jesus is more than a prophet, that he's not just a great man. John's Gospel differs from the others, namely because it's focused on who Jesus really is. It is uh, one of the Gospels, the other three are called synoptic, they have light views, but John is more theological. John, John lets you know that uh, there's a trinity, that there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, amplifies the fact that Jesus is more than a prophet, more than just a man. John would say to us today, Jesus is not to be compared to Buddha. He's not to be compared to Krishna. He's not to be compared to Muhammad or Gandhi or any other human being that ever lived that even did positive things and that really uh, assisted society and helped cultures uh, live better and do better. But there's one thing about Jesus that if understood, it sets Christianity apart from all of the other religions. This is the dividing asunder between Christianity and the rest of the world religions. It's found right here in the Gospel of John. John's message reveals to us and substantiates the teaching of the Trinity by revealing what is known as the deity of Jesus Christ. What does the deity of Jesus mean? Jesus is God. We're the only religion in the world that believes that Jesus goes beyond a great man and beyond a great prophet. He's worshiped. He is God. Jesus performed miracles. Jesus did a whole lot of other things that we, we can talk about. But for the sake of time, even John said, if everything that he ever done was written in the books, the libraries of the world at that time could not contain them. Jesus is God. That's the difference between us, y'all, and the other religions of the world. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And it appears to be the intent of John to reveal to us Jesus as God. So the Gospel of John reveals to us that Jesus, I'm going to prove it, has always been. He's always existed. That he was creating in the beginning. 
when the Bible said, let us make men in our image. So the book reveals that Jesus is light and he is life. Listen to what it says, John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In the beginning with the word, the word with God, the word was God. This word, we have to find out who he is. So who was this word? John 1, 14. So the word became flesh, human, and made his home dwelt among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the father's one and only son. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then listen to me, John 14 says, that word became human. That word was the only begotten son of God. That word was Jesus, who was in the beginning with God. And there's nothing that is made that was made by him, not made by him and through him. Are y'all still with me? So John reveals Jesus, and uh, the Bible calls this a mystery. And, and some people ain't going to get it. When I said that the deity of Jesus, Jesus is God, you'd be surprised how many believers, how many Christians or people in the valley of decision, that's their problem. They, they can't grasp that Jesus is God. And the Bible even lets us know that it is a mystery now because these things are spiritually discerned. And sometimes you can't understand things in a natural mind. And if you don't come to him believing, and if you don't come to him first believing that he exists, then this stuff ain't going to never make sense to you. But there is a mystery, 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, firstly, great is the mystery of godliness. Here it is. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and watch this, received up in glory. Who is that? Jesus. Who is he? God in the flesh. Who is he? God was manifest in the flesh. He's the word that was made flesh. Are you still with me? So John also reveals Jesus as light and life. John 1 4. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Remember I said that darkness is this sin and degradation and deception and confusion. The world, many are saying, is in darkness. That It needs light. We're, we're pummeling towards something. I don't know where we're going, but things are falling apart. It's, you can look at the election that's coming up and look around the world with the wars and the rumors of wars, earthquake and diverse places, pestilence and famine, all kinds of stuff prophesied. This would be the signs of the end times and then deception is everywhere. The, the internet has just opened the world up to opinions and to how people feel and what people think to where people can't even know what truth is anymore because their favorite celebrity said or their, their friend said or their, their friend that they never met said because I don't know why y'all got all these friends and you ain't never met them. Back in the day when we were in the hood, you had some friends and you had some people in the hood. Yeah, everybody wasn't your friend. And so now you can't just say you my friend you my friend you my friend and the person is not your friend because they like you they they like what they see in you they like you they they like you they 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 like parts of you they like pieces of you I, I'm, I'm gonna preach myself happy yeah? you know there's some people who got married off of that you know parts and and pieces what you like you know yeah if you like thighs and breasts and legs Go to Popeye's and, and, and get you some chicken and leave marriage alone. So John says that in order for men to receive the life that God promises, they have to be introduced to the light. Preachers today have the responsibility to announce that the light has come. We should never forget also that we are not the light we are not the light if you stay close to me and follow me around you'll instantly instantly get the revelation that i ain't jesus and that goes for anybody that's out here 
because even in the church of Jesus Christ, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we sin, we can confess our sin because he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the world tells you when you're trying to share with them about what their condition is, that because you have an issue or something in your life, they just write you off and say, you are, you, you're not right. You, how many of y'all have found that with your family members? In particular, you ain't, you ain't nobody. But your neighbor and stuff. God, I still know what you do. Who would that came over last night? Yeah, they just came over to get some salt. <laughs> some sugar. I mean, some uh, flour. <laughs> we must never forget that we're supposed to simply bear witness of the light. Right? It's my purpose today, brothers and sisters, women and children, boys and girls, to bear witness of the light. Now, you can call me Vaughn the Baptist if you like. I know my role today. In our text, a man by the name of John the Baptist, not God, John who wrote the gospel, but John the baptizer, he came and announced something, that there was light that was coming, and this light would be available to all. He says there's one coming whose shoes he cannot even bend down, stoop down to unloose or to unlatch. John 1, 6 says, there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. The Bible says, watch what you might have missed, God sent him. He was sent from God. And now we got to face it. Let's stop for a minute. Not everybody that's preaching in our pulpits is sent from God. Not everybody is sent by God. Some were called, some were sent, some just picked up their briefcase and went. Some even went without a briefcase. You know what an expert is, right? Anybody 50 miles outside of town with a briefcase. All right? They look important, they look like somebody, but most of those briefcases in the pulpit are empty. Uh, imagine people growing up all their life sitting and listening to a preacher, never understanding what they're saying. Never understanding what is being said. And then our young people come up behind that and they visit us and they listen and they've been off to school, not just educated, they just got sense, right? And so they're trying to figure out what is this all about? What's going on? It's one thing to have the kind of worship that challenges people where you just, everybody's standing and everybody's singing. That's one thing. But then when you have a preacher who preaches and then you can't understand that, then he's like, what's the purpose of being here? And you want to know why so many people have been turned off with the church and why some people don't go? It's because some were called, some were sent, some just picked up their briefcase and went. And they're holding churches hostage. Come on, there's been a hostile takeover of our pulpits because Satan himself manifests as an angel of light. How be it that his ministers transform themselves and impersonate ministers of righteousness, all right? So that's just the way it is. And so you gotta get that. So when a preacher is sent from God, like John the Baptist and Jesus, they can speak then as one with authority. They can speak and not be concerned about who they're offending or who don't like it or, or the religious quo or the big givers. They don't have to do that. John came preaching in the wilderness. He said, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Repent ye. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He came preaching. What y'all come out here to see? Somebody dressed in fine raiment? Come on. What you come out here to see? A reed shaking in the wind? He said, repent. Turn from your sin. Now, you can't preach like that except God sent you. And y'all know there's some stuff I say, man, the average Joe would like, you know, I'm going to see him after church. <laughs> so he came in the authority that God gave him himself. Like God sent Moses, he sent John. Like God sent Isaiah, he sent John. Like God sent Jeremiah, he sent John. Like God sent Daniel into Babylon and, Babylon and Joseph into Egypt to represent him. I believe that God still sends preachers to rep him. And those preachers will always get him some glory and I believe this is true in spite of all the shenanigans and the buffoonery that we see being presented by preachers in the name of Jesus 
Our internet right now is flooded with all kinds of shenanigans and buffoonery and people who have never set foot in the church who will never set foot in church because of what they see on the internet. Everybody that says they're a church and everything you see on the internet is not from God. You cannot measure the true church of Jesus Christ by what you see on the internet. That's not who we are. All those funny church videos and all that kind of stuff. Before COVID and people started buying time and going on YouTube and TikTok and all that kind of stuff, folk could do what they wanted to do and it was just them four and no more. Nobody could tell what was going on. Nobody knew what was happening. But now you got folk with five members that has an international ministry and their own TV and they're doing little goofy stuff and folk at home said, is that the church? I need about 55 people. Come on here. That the church and it's giving us a bad name. So I believe that God still sends preachers today, preachers that are bent on introducing people to the light, just like John the Baptist here. Romans 10, 14 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That next verse says, and how can they preach except they be sent? So God still sins. So listen to the word and what this word says about John the Baptist. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, John the Baptist came to bear witness. He couldn't save anybody. Matter of fact, no man can save anybody. Men get saved when they come to the light. If John the Baptist were here today and was pastor of a local church, he would probably let us know, this is not my church. You are not my people. This is the Lord's church and you are the Lord's people. It's his spirit and it's his word. John's job was to preach about the light, was to point people to the light. His job was to let them know that Jesus is that light. The light of Jesus can deliver anybody from any spiritual darkness. The problem is people just don't know and don't understand what darkness is. So many overeducated and religious oriented people don't believe that they are even in darkness. You heard the other day in the, in the debate where the, the America's in darkness. The other one's saying we're doing better than we've ever been. One of them saying, well, we're worse than we've ever been. The other one's saying, well, we're doing better than we've ever been. And that's the way it is with some people. If you try to explain to them that there might be something wrong with them, that there might be something wrong in their lives, a lot of times they just don't get it. They can't see it. The problem is people don't know and don't understand what darkness is. John 3, 19 says this. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Our deeds, our evil deeds, our sinful practices blind us to the light, separates between us and God. Habakkuk said that God's eyes are too pure as to behold evil. So sometimes when we are in sin and God trying to get our attention, it takes something to kind of break up the fallow ground. It takes something. When I was first introduced to the gospel and I heard about Lord and I was like, oh, no, no, Lord, Lord Calvert drink that you know I didn't know anything about spirit I knew wine and spirits you know you take that and you know and uh, you know the grass faded and the, you know and this that passed away the only grass <laughs> that I knew was was what my daddy grew down there in Reddick that marijuana yeah so <laughs> yeah I'll tell, I got a story about that I'll tell y'all one day because people have not seen the light they continue in doing deeds that are evil and sinful, and they do it with no conviction. Amen. Did y'all get that? Here's a picture of what I mean. Oh, y'all didn't get this. John 9, 39. Jesus said to a group of Pharisees, high-minded pious peacocks of, of, the, of God's zoo as if no sin have they done, looking down their ecclesiastical noses, a bunch of self-righteous folk. Here's what he said. I came into the world, in this world, so that the world could be judged. I came so that the blind would see, and so that those who see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were nearby heard Jesus say this and asked, Are you saying we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But since you keep saying you see, 
your guilt remains. He said, if you would just acknowledge, because the, the issue was there was a boy that was born blind that got healed. These guys asked who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus said, nobody, but that the works of God could be made manifest. And so he says, well, what are you trying to say? We need to see too? Jesus said, if you say you can see, but if you just admit you can't see, if you just admit the darkness, if you can just admit to your human frailties and deficiencies, then you can see. But because you say you see or that you you don't need to see you remain blind do you know what this is saying there's some very sharp people who have no clue because of their own deeds about what sin is they've been in it so long that they've gotten acclimated to it anesthetized to any type of conviction as a result of what they do they don't understand what all the fuss is about when it comes to moral issues and what is right and what is wrong. They don't have any conviction about anything. So Jesus came to shine light on the sin and the evil deeds because those things are done in the dark. So when you come to the light, those deeds are exposed. So in order for, to, to bring conviction that could bring conversion, there has to be confrontation. And when you are confronted with light, it exposes darkness because light and darkness are contrary one to another. You begin to see who you are. Can I get about 10 people out there? It was John the Baptist's preaching that drew attention to who Jesus was and what receiving and believing on him can do for us. Matthew 3, 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist was literally a voice, just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. And what humility this man possessed. He was just happy with just being a voice. He didn't say, I, John the Baptist, a prophet of God, man of God, apostle, prophet, evangelist. No, he says, just a voice. He was willing to decrease so that Jesus could increase. He said, I must decrease so that he can increase. Every time I stand to preach, y'all, I don't care what you might feel in your gut. It's just my chance to just be a voice. The voice of one just crying in a dark wilderness saying, get right with God. He's coming. Today and every time I preach, I just simply bear witness of the light. I am not that light. John 1, 8, John was not the light, but he came to tell people the truth about the light. And that's all I'm trying to do today, to let people viewing me online and people that will watch this six months from now, six years from now, that you must come to the light. I'm here to tell you about the light. The apostle John reveals in his gospel that Jesus wanted no man to be unsure about how to have a right relationship with God the Father. John wants no man or nobody to know, not know how to get to live eternally in heaven with God. I've done more funerals in the last four months than I have in the last maybe 14 years. I mean, it's been crazy, absolutely crazy. And when these bodies are laid in front of the pulpit, and, and some y'all, if Jesus don't come back again, all of y'all are gonna lay at a, at a funeral home or be burnt or whatever. But if they bring your body into a church building, what we gonna say? You know, your dash determines what the preacher preaches. You were born here, you died here. What you do in between there? that we can recognize that maybe you are worthy of eternity in heaven. Here's how you get to heaven. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Come on, there might be 50 ways to leave your lover and 20 ways to get to Atlanta, but there ain't but one way to get to the Father. And that's through Jesus. Matter of fact, John 10, 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and find pasture or find provision and everything that they need. So if you don't believe that there's only one way, if that bothers you, that we're so narrow minded, that there's only one door. And if you are adamant about it, it don't make you right. It's just the fact you don't believe it. And you may say to me, well, what if you're wrong, Bishop? What if what you're saying ain't right? Watch this. 
at least if I am right, I go to heaven. If you're wrong, you may one day be all dressed up and nowhere to go. Because if you don't believe in a heaven and a hell, <laughs> why get dressed? So it's back to the opening verse of John 1. I'm going to preach myself happy and we'll go home. This light that came into the world was in the beginning with God and the light we found out was God. The truth is this. God became one of us to save us. Yes. Scripture said through the sin of one man have sin passed on us all, but through the obedience of one can all be saved. Save who? Save us. Save all of us. John 1, 9. The true light that gives light to how many men? Every man was coming into the world. That gives light to how many men? Everyone comes into the world. What does that verse say? The true light that gives that to everyone. That is not the translation, but we'll go from there. Every man was coming into the world. And there are different years on the new NIV. There are different translations of the NIV. So we have to pick the one. So every man, literally, watch this, every sort of man. Let me get to this message because I'm going to reach out right now to somebody in the back corner and I'm going to help you. Every sort of man. So the light has come for every man in the world to be able to come to know God and live eternally with him. What sort of man is every man? Black man? White man? Come on, brown man? Yellow man? Red man? Poor man? Rich man? Proud man, broken man, gay man, straight man, rich man, poor man, drunk man, sober man, drug addict man, non-sober, drug addict. I'm, I'm using man to speak of mankind. He so loved the world, all of mankind, all people. The light came to give light to all men. It doesn't matter where you be. Anybody here have a testimony? It doesn't matter. I have one. Yeah, I was a no good, good for nothing, low down, scum of the earth, back, back, the home, and sinner on my way to hell. But God, who is rich in mercy with his great love, with his love, that God saved me. Now, I need some testimonials on here. You were swinging on the pole. You were out there on them streets. You were acting the fool. You were toe up from the flow up. You were drunken and cool to brown. Come on, you were smoking more weed than Carter got liver pills. Carter little liver pills. You had all kinds of issues. You were tired of living and afraid to die. Come on, y'all. You were pounding stuff that nobody ever found about. You put Pointing your finger at other people and what they're doing in life, trying to act like you better than them. The Bible said, in such words, some of you, he came for all of us. He came for the whoremonger, the fornicator, the drunkard, the liar. He came from the lesbians, the prostitutes. He came for, you name it, he came for everybody. Jesus ain't never turned nobody away. Whoever comes to him, he's got something to offer them. He's the light of the world. He's the light of the world. He has come to give life and light to people. We can't be looking down our ecclesiastical noses at people because of where they are right now. Where were you? Where were you when he found you with your crazy self? You ain't got no business in lifting up holy hand. Hallelujah. Just the fact that God allows you to do that. You ought to just think back over your life and just remember where you come from. Come on, you ought to just think back over your life and say, wait a minute, I used to be, I can't believe I'm in here. I can't believe I'm, I can't believe I'm clothing in my right mind. I can't believe my bills are paid, that I got a husband or a wife. I can't believe I got children. I can't believe I got a roof over my head. I used to walk these streets, run these streets, live in these streets. Every time I stand here to preach, Sam, I think about I got arrested in this building. They grabbed me, y'all, family members. I was 24 years old. They snatched me up hiding behind a refrigerator over here. Grabbed me, bound me up, and threw me out of this mall out there and said, don't you ever come back in here again. And then I came to the light. Come on, y'all ain't helping me here. And look like the light has guided me. For some of y'all who don't understand Christianity, don't understand what I'm trying to say to you, what's wrong with you? I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see because I came to the light. And he's trying to get somebody to come to the light. Block out what your friends say. Block out what you learned in school. Block out. When I went to college, I went to university, those folk told me some stuff that I still don't understand. Right? But my mama told me some stuff before I ever got there. And it wasn't from the Bible. It was just mama sense. Come on, y'all. There is a God. I thought my mama was from Lordy, Florida. Because she would pray, oh, Lordy. Lordy, help me. I didn't understand it. 
I had no idea. But here I am now, man, years later. And mama's speaking to me now louder than she did when she was here. There's just some things you learn early about stuff. You don't need a chapter and a verse from the Bible. You just know whether it's right or not. Grow up in the hood. We got some laws, some rules. There's some things you don't do. So people were blinded to the light. And like they're blinded today, John 1.10. He was in the world and through the world. And though the world was made uh, through him, uh, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, his own people, but his own did not receive him. The God of this world is who blinds our minds. The Bible said, the Lord G, God of this world blinds our mind, lest we come to the glorious light of the gospel. So our eyes are dimmed by the God of this world. So Jesus' coming didn't just split time in hell, it divided the entire human race. John 1, 12. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Did you see that? It says that you get the right to become the children of God. The Bible says in 1 John, these are the children of God and the children of the devil. Them that do righteous is righteous even as he is righteous. But those that continue in sin are of their father, the devil. So everybody ain't God's children. You're either a child of God or you're not. You're either saved or you're not. You can't be half saved and, and you can't be almost saved. Now, I mean, you, you, and living like you are saved. If you're almost saved, then come on in. Right? But the world now is saved and unsaved, light and darkness. It says that they, 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 they get the right to become the children of God. So you're either a child of God or you're not. Now, notice I didn't call you a child of the devil, but that's the real deal. <laughs> so listen to me, everybody on the sound of my voice. I put this on the screen. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people do. There's none good. No, not one. Plagiarism says that you, you, you measure at the end of your journey, your good exceeds your bad. I remember that's how I used to thought, if I don't kill nobody, don't rob no bank, and in the end, and I help a lot of people, I just go to heaven. That's not the way this works, right? Jesus is very clear about that. And so when people say they're good people, that don't guarantee them a seat in heaven or a dwelling in heaven. Salvation is not something that can be earned. It's a gift. It's something given to us by God through Christ, and it has to be received. Nobody is good enough to go to heaven on their own merit. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God or the light of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Christ, our Lord. So why do people yet reject the light? Why do people reject Jesus? Why do people wrestle with a simple message like this? John 1.10. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. How does that happen? And why do people not recognize him today? Why do people wrestle with this? Here we go. Largely because of our preaching. The Bible said that there are preachers who preach another gospel. Yes. And yet not another, but they pervert this one. How many of y'all have heard perverted gospel? Where you sit there in front of somebody with your Bible in your hand, with all of your senses, and you sit right there and go, that ain't right. <laughs> now, I, 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 don't, I don't know chapter and verse, but that ain't right. I mean, I don't even know what Genesis is in the Bible, but that ain't right. And then there's just this perverted gospel. It's a twisted gospel. If, 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 if Jesus is not, and the gospel is not introduced or preached properly, people can't come to the light. It, 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 they can't come to the light. People with little to no proper understanding of God, they find it hard to recognize Jesus, and they then find it hard to truly trust him for salvation or for life or even to believe that there's a God because of our presentation 
So when I slow down and put scriptures on the screen, when I slow down and not get into that cadence where that's what you're used to, that's the way grandpa preached and, and great grandpa preached and all that kind of stuff, but it didn't produce any fruit in anybody or it just helped you to hold on. But Jesus said, I didn't come for you just to hold on. He said, I came that you might have life and, and that you might have that life more abundantly. I came to give you a new existence. The reason we're able to do the things that we do in the community in the state and around the world and internationally like we do it's because of the life that he's given us the abundant life that we possess where we hire and employ hundreds of people where we have businesses and we've owned our own bank and we got one of the greatest schools in the world and all this different stuff and properties and, and we're debt free oh no man nothing but to love them it's because of the abundant life it ain't, this ain't mama and them religion this ain't the old church high steeple few people us for no more this ain't about that and ain't nothing wrong with that if that's where they are that's where they live but everybody should be seeking to maximize the moment maximize their potential give God their best let the Lord live through you be more than a choir member be more than a deacon be more than a bishop be more than a preacher be a bona fide sanctified child of God who lives for God 24 7 after the benediction who lives for God Monday through Sunday who lives for God every day all day 24 7 let that be your testimony I need about 55 people in here who believe that that's right to say that's right preacher I already told you I'm almost done why the light came God so loved the world for the record Jesus didn't come to condemn us he came to save us save who anybody man we all jacked up out here all of us he came to save us Today's church is a void of the presence of God. You can hear a whole sermon and won't even hear the name Jesus. They're void of his power. They're void of his anointing. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Tradition rules them. Uh -huh. By keeping your tradition, the Bible said you make the word of God of none effect. Tradition, religion controls them. Religion is man's attempt to be right with God. It's just a whole bunch of you work and you do and God's going to accept you. And then ignorance. Some people just, they just, nothing wrong with this word. This word is not bad in of itself. Ignorance means you just don't know. And why would you take somebody who does know and sit there and you don't know and then critique the person that does know? I went to university. We had some of the greatest professors in the world. Sociology, psychology, my major, so on and so on and so on. I took some biology, and then when I, every time I got close to organic chemistry, I went back to PE. So I started taking <laughs> classes that I know I can pass. But those professors that were there, those professors taught us, and we paid to be taught, right? Now, I was on scholarship. I didn't have to pay. Now somebody was paying for it, but you paid to be taught, right? You go to school. If your parents sent you to college, university, you go there to learn. You don't go there in the class as an 18-year-old knucklehead straight out the hood talking about, I mean, hold on, doc, doc, I don't, I don't think that's right. You don't go there, the man just told you about the solar system and how the sun is 93 million miles from this and our light travels at 186,000 miles per second and all that kind of stuff and how far the moon is to the core from Miami, Florida and all this kind of stuff and then measure this stuff out and you're going to sit up there talking about, but I, I don't think that's right. And then people come to the church house and find somebody that is proven to be a child of God, a man or woman of God, somebody who's learned and somebody who's trained and somebody who's experienced the presence of God and the power of God and they don't really know God, they haven't come to the light and they'll leave talking about what they heard. I don't believe that, that ain't right, I don't believe it. And the manifestation is right before them. They can see what this kind of message has done. They can see the impact that it's had on the lives of other people. They can see the impact that it had on the life of the person that's speaking and still they won't believe and still they won't accept it they won't receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior but the church light has weakened and many of our churches are just void of a clarion clear voice and the light is dim now because there's a cheap imitation of the true light John 1 12 again Reminds us of what happens when the light is properly presented. John 1, 12, yet to all who receive him, the light, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus came to give life to all who believe. He came to the, the hurting, 
to heal them. He came to the fearful to calm them. He, he came to destroy, the Bible said, the works of the devil, to heal all that were oppressed of the devil. He came that you might have that life I talked about. He's saying to somebody in here today that if you would just receive him, he'll give you power to become a child of God. You just can't become a part of the family of God or church a member on your own. Even in the natural family, you got to be born in. You just can't join in. My family is here with me today and my desire is to see all of them know who Jesus really is. That we get on one accord, not just about our history and our heritage, but about our true heritage. When you think about your bloodline and your genealogy, let's go back to Adam. All of us come from him, all right? Out of one blood made in many nations. So we're all, by nature, children of God because we're God's creation. But when it comes to family and immediate family, we have to siphon who's in. Because I saw some people last night that was eating some extra food. I don't know how deep they are into the family so the deal is the family I'm preaching y'all has certain rights <laughs> has certain privileges when you really in the family can I get 10 people to say about three people in my family they say he ain't talking about me he ain't talking about me I, I, I'm in the family I'm a McLaughlin for real it's a, so so it doesn't matter what your last name is if your name has not been written in heaven So I'm closing now. So here's John's gospel. It says a man must be born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, and I'm not talking about you going back into your mother's womb and being born a second time. That which is flesh is flesh, but that which is spirit is spirit. Here's how we're born again. I'm going to read it again. But as many, verse 12, has received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We have to be born again. Not just of our blood, not just of our heritage, of our roots, not just in the natural, but in the spirit. Being a Christian doesn't come by osmosis. You're not a child of God because you were raised in the church. Amen. You're, you're being raised in the church. No one makes you a Christian that's sleeping in the garage makes you a car. You don't become a child of God by living a good life, I told you. You don't become a child of God by declaring yourself a Christian. You don't become a child of God by singing gospel songs, by just singing the music or wearing or not wearing certain clothes. That ain't going to save you. Looking at people, tell me, look what she got on. Look what he got on. Look. At, some of y'all don't even know what this is. Is he an Indian? Is he African? What is, what is going on here? It's not the outward of Dawning or the plaiting of the hair or the wearing of apparel. It's not, it's the hidden man of the heart, that meek and the quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. It's when God has changed you, broken you down like a Chevy with four flat tires. It's when God took away that old mean spirit, that old nasty way that you had. It's when God took the weed out of your lungs and took the liquor off your shelf. It's when God has done something to make you a positive influence in the life of children and children's children. But you can model for other people what it means to be a man of God, a woman of God or just a moral upright citizen in this land so that they don't get incarcerated. There's no pastor there's no priest, there's no bishop there's no people, there's no pope that can make you a Christian or can declare you a Christian. Being Baptist can't save you. Being Methodist can't save you. CME can't save you Pentecostal can't save you Apostolic can't save you I don't care what your denomination is being culture can't save you you must be born again running down an aisle shouting and jumping all up in church laying on an altar won't save you even getting baptized doesn't save you in and of itself god is the one that saves us god is the one that gives us the power to become the children of god and it's a free gift from god it is by grace through faith that we're saved in christ jesus and not that of ourselves it's the free gift of god not a works lest any man should boast it doesn't cost you anything you don't have to pay for this there's nothing you got to do for this. All you got to do is receive this. The battle's been fought. The victory
victory has been won. Good God Almighty, when you put your faith in the light that has come, and that would be Jesus, when we trust Christ and Christ alone, we are then given the power and the right to become the children of God. The true light Jesus can lighten anybody's dark soul. The light can heal any self-inflicted wound. The light can heal depression and rejection. The light can heal low self-esteem and those negative words that have been spoken over your life. You'll never be this and you'll never do that. The devil is a liar. You are who you are by the grace of Almighty God. Words like you'll never become anything won't mean anything. They'll never touch you. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. There's no weapon that is formed against you that shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you have the authority, the power to condemn wounds of low self-esteem and negative words that have been spoken. Jesus comes to erase them. One word from the Lord can erase all of the words of the devil. Everything that the devil been saying to you all your life, you'll never get that job. You'll never have that house. You'll never get that education. You'll never have those children. You'll never get married. All those words he's been saying, one word from the Lord. Uh, come on, just one word. Repent. Uh, just one word from the Lord can change all of that. So Jesus came as a man. He was touched with all our pain, with all the feelings of our infirmity. He died on a cross so that he could defeat our worst enemy, which was death and the fear of dying. There was one enemy that man could not conquer. It was death and the fear of dying. But Jesus came and he bore our sins and our diseases. He came to make us both spiritually and physically free and he saved us he rescued us and he's available to all of us how do I know he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we healed he was wounded he was wounded he came to offer his life I don't know whether you've seen the passion of Christ it was gruesome but it didn't come close to what he actually went through they killed Jesus they turned him over for punishment by the Romans, saying that he claimed to be God. That's right. John said before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. He said, he that have seen me, all in John, have seen the Father. He said, me and my Father are one. And they just thought that that was blasphemy. And so Pilate said, are you the king? Are you the king of the Jews? He said, you say, whatever it is you think I am, I am that. Because I am that I am. They turned him over for punishment and he went through a whole bunch of stuff for us. You think you've been through something. No, what Jesus went through for you, for the joy that was set before him. He endured the contradiction of sinners. He had his beard plucked. He wore a crown of thorns on his head, the hypodermics on the needles sticking down into his central nervous system, sending pain throughout his entire body, those signals coming back up and rotating in his head. He was screaming with no relief. They whipped him with a cat of nine tails. They tried to play games with him, put a mask over his head and slapped him and say, prophesy, tell us who hit you. If you're such a prophet, you should know what's going on here. The cat of nine tails was a strap that had bone and metal in it. It was hung on a stick and they would have professional hitters strikers that would strike and rip the skin flame open like a fish like you would flay a catfish they ripped the skin off his back where his bone sinew tissue was showing and open where the sun beat down in it where the germs and dirt that can get into his body disease could enter him through the orifices that were now opened the flesh the gaping holes that were now in his body they whooped him unmercifully. These were Romans. They didn't have this law, 40 stripes, save one, or just 39 stripes for the 39 diseases that people preach about. They didn't want to stay there all day. They wanted to go home. They wanted to get off. They wanted to beat him till he died right there. He bled. He was bleeding out. He was anemic. And then after all of that, they put his cross, that big old beam, over 100 pound beam on his back, 200 pound beam on his back, and made him carry his own cross down the Via Dolorosa. And people tell me he's some 
emaciated white dude hanging on the cross, leaning like this. No, this boy was raised in the Mediterranean sun, and he was a carpenter, and he was the perfect man. How else can you be beaten like that? How else could you bleed out like that and still pick up your cross, good God Almighty, and carry it down that Via Della Rosa? Jesus was a real man, ladies. Y'all would have loved Jesus. He was a perfect man, good God Almighty. But he bore that cross down the Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering for all of my Hispanic people that are here and as he walked down that road people jeered and spit in his face and mocked him he fell beneath the weight of that cross he had to have somebody to come and help him carry that cross a brother showed up and grabbed the cross so must Jesus bear his cross alone and all the world go free no there's a cross for everyone there's a cross for you and a cross for me and notice even Jesus himself didn't bear his cross alone so how you think you're gonna make it in life without it how you think you're gonna make it in life and not have have some support and not have some help how you think you're gonna be all right you've got a little money in the bank your money will run out you got a nice house that house will fall apart let a hurricane come let an earthquake hit let something happen houses fall god doesn't even dwell in buildings made by hand but he dwells in us we're the temples of the holy ghost and we live and abide forever when we believe on him Jesus went through for us what he went through is indescribable I'm trying to get you to see it but it was indescribable you got to get this if you ever get this story and really believe it if you just want to reject it and try that like what I'm saying is fallacy and not real then nobody teach me that I read this and I got it man in my spirit and this thing jumped out at me he was wounded for me he went through for me he was hung up for my hang up they took him to the hill called Golgotha nailed him then through his hands and his feet on a wooden beam and dropped him in a hole hung him in a flex he had to push up the breathe push up the breathe and they wanted him to die so they can go home they wanted him to die but there he was hanging on that cross and even on the cross let me show you the kind of man he was he said father forgive them they know not what they do John had already said if they knew who he was they would never have crucified who him Jesus and I'm trying to tell y'all he was hung up there and he had to die on that cross he was on that cross with you on his mind he was on that cross with me on his mind he was on that cross you should have been punished you should have died you should have been there you should have felt the wrath of God but he took it for you good God almighty he died in your place come on he gave up the ghost father into thy hands I commend my spirit and then he spent three days his body in a grave his spirit went to the father he descended into the earth let captivity captive gave gifts unto men glory be to God on the third day they reunited his body rose from the grave he said all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth all power and then later he said now I give you power over all the power of the wicked one I need about 55 people who believe in Jesus to shout in this place For three days, the body of Jesus lay in a borrowed tomb. But on the third day, Jesus rose again. The light came back on. The light went out. But it came back on. It was just momentary. It was a part of the plan destroy this temple and in three days because I'm God I'll raise it up again you see what I mean because Paul said if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead you'll be saved Jesus said destroy this temple and I'll raise it up the light came back on now that light is seated on the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession. Do me a favor. If you have strength in your legs and you're going to walk out of here today under your own control and power, only if you have strength in your legs and you're going to do that, you know he gave you the strength, could you stand on your feet just in reverence of this moment? Just in reverence and just, just in obedience to my request. And then I want you to deal with something. I was lost 
and didn't know it. Don't walk up. How would that blind Pharisee that said, are you trying to say I'm blind? I'm looking at a guy, I don't mind me sharing horse, that was a starting linebacker in the SEC for University of Florida. Real gator for all my old Cali folk, Charles Charlie Horse Williams, my senior class president. He's standing here looking at me. I was in the Q Fitness Center working out. I hadn't seen Horse in years, in years. Horse saw me. I ran over to him and hugged him. I was so excited to see him. That's my boy. We grew up in the same hood, yeah, you know, same school and all that stuff. Played for some of the same teams, same coaches. And I hugged him too close. Horse was like, Wayne, I saw popcorn today and I saw him. You know Von McLaughlin. And I think he came. <laughs> Didn't he do it, Wayne? And when there's nothing, hey, I ain't got a problem. <clears throat> I know who I am. <clears throat> he was having an issue. And he didn't know Jesus. Church member, faithful, Baptist. And later on, when did you invite him? Who brought who, who told him to come on Lane Avenue? He invited you. You invited him. You can talk, you can use your outside voice. You're, 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 you're a scientist, you know, that's another mad scientist too, y'all. She's a scientist, a brilliant mind, brilliant woman. They came on Lane Avenue. <coughs> And I'm preaching. I don't forget all about horse. But I'm preaching and I looked up and here he is in the middle of the aisle. <laughs> Drafted by the New England Patriots. <clears throat> Big strong guy. Educated. Degree. We served us as principal for the interim here in, in our school but had been in administration in school for years. Nothing wrong with him. The light came on. Come on, he came to the light. Came to the light. The light came on. You know, if there is a heaven and a hell, and I truly believe there is, it ain't because somebody taught me about it, I mean, it showed it to me. I was preaching three months after I got saved. I was teaching all over the city of Jacksonville. Ain't never been in nobody's Bible school or nothing. God filled me with his spirit and he put me on a mission. I was one of a voice of one crying in the wilderness and I ain't stopped crying yet. Both ways, I'll cry and cry. He broke me down. I had a great job, man. I had a super job. I was working for Norfolk and Southern Railway. I would be retired today living on a beach somewhere with my railroad retirement, like them other guys I left out there. And they see me all the time, say, he like this, you still working, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm still working. And I got my retirement. Yeah. There's some of you that came to the light one day. Your world changed. How can y'all remember when you came to the light? And I'm not being spooky, I mean, but you came to the light. Come to the light. You realize, he said, Jesus, that I come to judge the world of sin, not to condemn, but to reveal that we are in need of a savior. When the law was given, it wasn't to make people perfect. In the flesh, nobody can keep the law. It was given to reveal to us our need for a savior. And Jesus came and fulfilled the law. And now when he stands before us, we see the true light. And that true light is the life of men. And Jesus has come to give us that life. So I said all that to say this, there is a heaven and a hell. Amen. In order to live eternally in heaven with God, you gotta come through the door. And so many people find that so difficult. The guy we baptized today, Ernest, you know, he's 39. He said, I want to identify. There's nothing. That's why we say publicly, why do people walk an aisle? Or why do people, because you're not ashamed. Whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. It's your first opportunity to publicly say, 
I want to be a child of God. I want to follow the Lord. I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Navy guy. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I, I have a great job. I'm a manager. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bona fide leader. I'm a coach. But I need Jesus. And I'll be a better coach and a better sailor and a better husband and a better wife. That's what he meant by life and that more abundantly. You get saved, you go right back to that same house in that same marital situation with them same crazy children. They are no better, but you are. They haven't changed, but you have. And so what Jesus is saying is, you go back to that same job, but you go back different. You get around them same people, but I got you. And now you have somebody you can depend on. When they sing that song, the Lord is my shepherd. All these songs are necessary when I lean on him. All of these things are purposed so that we can sing them and know who he is and reiterate and re-strengthen and strengthen ourselves and, and, and build on top of our faith. So if you're in this room and you've never come to the light, I just want you to know you can come to the light that Jesus is available for you. You can walk out of that chair, out of those red seats, and say, you know what? I've been in church all my life. I've been a deacon. I've been this all my life. But good God, I was just working my finger to the bone. I said earlier, you're working and didn't know Jesus. Come on, man. Come on, there's somebody else. He's not alone. Come on. He's not alone. Come on, y'all. This little man here chosen come on somebody else you you don't you don't know jesus come to him right now this is your opportunity you don't have tomorrow you know tomorrow not promise you chosen sinner this is this is the chosen sinner you knew what was going on boy this is the chosen sinner and that's who you are we all have sinned and come short of glory god but god through eternity has chosen us before time come on he's elected you before the world begins this could be your day. This is the moment you've been waiting for. Don't be afraid. Don't be nervous. Don't trip now. Don't leave earth without him. Don't leave here today without him. To my family, I say to you guys, listen, we're flesh and blood relatives. That's natural. Jesus said, what is born of the flesh is flesh, but what's born of the spirit his spirit we all know that there's a difference between being a true child of God and being religious and being a true child of God and being lost we know that there's a difference in having true peace and having faith and artificial peace you know that there's a difference and so I say to my family I get a chance and, and it blows me away that I get a chance to speak to the people that I love more than anybody in the world as I looked at my family I see myself, I see my blood, I see my granddaddy, I see my grandmama, I see my auntie, my cousin, and, and it just blesses me. You coming, baby, come on down. Come on, give your heart to the Lord. You coming, come on, give your heart to the Lord. Come on. And, 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 I, and I go like, Every one of your professions can be heightened. I'm a professional. I was appointed business ambassador by the governor. Listen, by the governor here in the state. I won entrepreneurial awards. Jim Moran Business Institute of Excellence. Come on down. Come on down. Come on, they're still coming. Come on down. Come on this way. Bring them this way, Harry. Bring them right here. Right here. Jim Moran was the doorkeeper, gatekeeper for Toyota. And I won the Jim Moran Entrepreneurial Excellence Award, University of Florida State University, Jim Moran Business Institute. Never taken a business school before in my life. But our grand prize was being sent for in a $55 million jet, private, just my wife and I flown down to the Gallant Lady, which was at the time the most expensive yacht in the in the waters. 
And we took a cruise, went down Bahamas, North Bahamas, and rode. And I sat with Jim Moran, a Jewish man who's a billionaire. And he and I sat on the third deck of this gallant lady yacht. He was impressed by what God had done through us in the starting of our credit union on the Greyhound bus terminal. We had law, we had everything that was going on, restaurants, all this kind of stuff, schools. And it was a microcosm, he says, of what a city can look like and what a state can look like and what a nation can look like when people synergize and come together. We never had a federal state grant, never applied for one, didn't need one. We never had a philanthropic gift where somebody just sold a bunch of money. It was through the sweat equity of some hardworking people who wanted to make a change in the world, right? So we were on this boat. I got my Coke, he got his XO. He's drinking it down and he says, tell me, how did this happen? Who is your mentor? And I said to Jim Moran, true story. I said, you're Jewish, right? He said, yeah, I took a sip, my coat. And I said, my mentor is Jewish. He said, what kind of business was he in? <laughs> he said he was a carpenter. <laughs> but you don't do woodwork or nothing, no, but I do some other things that he did. And he taught me well. When I told him that Jesus was my mentor, and that I am what I am today because of my relationship with him. Here's what the challenge was. Not that that's not a regular story for most people, but he said, you're talking about him like he's here. And I said, he is. He is. He lives and he lives and he applauded me and could not believe the work that you guys are doing, that we do together. This is not my work, this is not my doing. This is a synergetic effort of people coming together, pooling their life resources, your gifts, your talents, even your finances. And we've been able to come together and renovate and spend multiple tens of millions of dollars in renovating and now possessing tens of millions of dollars worth of property and owing no man because of your diligence and because we came to the light and and we had a proper revelation of who he is we know who jesus is we know who the father is and we know there ain't but one way to get to him we know that he's the door and what you guys have done today oh god you're saving these young people oh <laughs> God, how old are you? 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17. All five of them, six of them, 17 years old. Come on, y'all. Where were you at 17? Which directory, trajectory were you on at 17? This is amazing. I met my wife, I was 17 years old. Second year of college at 17. I met her on the first day of school, transferred to the University of Tennessee, April 1st, and I saw her. I was 17, my world changed then too. But then it changed for real when I did what y'all did, right? So I want y'all to know that God loves you. He's got a great plan for your life. I can't wait to see what he's gonna do with y'all. We're gonna be here with you. We're gonna help you, all y'all from Jacksonville. You come from Jacksonville, you got parents here, anybody? Your parents, no parents here? How did you get here today? You all wrote, yeah, so you drove, who drove? All right, well praise God, you drove? Yeah, you, oh, you got a, oh, you got a mom, who got a mom here? That's your mommy? Oh, that's a blessing. Come on, stand, come give your daughter a big hug. Let them two go right there, they need you. They're living right here. Oh, reconciliation, healing, deliverance, you don't know what's happening. Right. Hey, we're about to go, but I love y'all. Father, thank you for these young ladies that are coming, this young man. Thank you, God. All 17 years young. God, we pray that you'll wrap your arms around them, that you'll fill them fresh with your spirit, that they, God, will realize that all they have to do is receive you. God, help them to turn away from the way they were going and turn to you and follow you for the rest of their lives. God, I thank you. I thank you that you can save anybody. 
in Jesus name amen take them with your hair come right there with him will you be ready will you be ready when Jesus comes Hey there, this is Tiffany, and we are celebrating with you if you've answered the call of God on your life and have accepted His Son Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, you are not alone in this new journey. We here at the Potter's House are here to help guide you on your new walk with Christ. If that is you, give us a call or a text at 1-800-TPH-4JAX. That's 1-800-874-4529. And let us know that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We would be more than happy to walk you through your next steps in Christ. You can also put in the chat, I accepted Jesus, and we'll reach out to you for your next step. Now, if you're interested in becoming a member, we welcome you to the Potter's House, and you can do it right here online. If you're viewing us from your computer, visit tphim.org, and in the top right-hand corner, click the link, become a member, and fill out the short form. If viewing us on a mobile device, Go to tphim.org, and in the top right-hand corner, select the menu bar, and then select Become a Member, and follow the prompts, and someone from our discipleship team will reach out to you. We thank you for joining us from wherever you may be viewing, and make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPHJAX so that you can receive alerts of when we're on the air.